Okay, so we're still talking about measures of central tendency. And remember, that's one score that best represents everybody. And now we're going to finish up by talking about the end-all, be-all measure of central tendency, which is the mean. So the mean is the sum of all scores divided by the number of scores. So let's just talk about the steps that are involved. The first thing we do is we sum up all the scores. So if we were interested in the mean height, we'd have to take everybody's score on their height and add them all up. And then we divide by n. And remember, n is your sample size or the number of observations you have. So we would divide by how many scores we recorded. And that's going to give us our mean. Now, I just want to remind you that we didn't have to put them in order. That was necessary for the median. The median required that we put everybody in order, and then we find the middle score. The mean does not require that we put them in order because we're just going to sum them all up and divide by how many there are. So let's practice one. We can use the data that um, we had on the last video for median, and we're going to practice summing them up and then dividing by how many we have. So the first step would be to take all our numbers. Remember, this was dollar in our pockets. Um, dollar is in our pocket. <laughs> We are going to take those and add them up. So we'd say 0 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 3. That totals 11. Now, I know that there are seven numbers there, so I'll take my 11 and divide it by 7, and that ends up being 1.57. So the mean dollars in our pocket is 1.57, or $1.57. Remember that our mode was 1 because there were three 1s in our data set. So we had a, a mode of 1. And if you can remember, we had a median of 1 because that was the one that was in the middle. So we had a mode of 1 and a median of 1, but a mean of 1.57. And that's okay. That will happen sometimes. And we're going to talk in a future video about how you know which measure of central tendency you should be using. So for right now, we're going to talk about the mean. We've added them up and divide by how many there are. So now that we kind of get the basics for how that's done, I do want to talk about symbols. We want to differentiate between the population and the sample. The population is kind of a, a theoretical idea. Let's say I want to know the population height. I'd never really get to know that. To measure the population average height, I'd have to go and measure everyone in the world. And there are people I just won't be able to get to, people who are hiding, people who are in very remote locations that I couldn't get to. And so what I would do instead was take a sample of people and see if I can make a guess then about what the population rate would be. Now, theoretically, if I could measure all people in the world, the math done for the population mean would be the same as the math done for my little baby sample mean. But... Because one is theoretical and one is actually what we recorded, we have different symbols that we use for those. So I want to clarify what those look like. So for the population, we're going to see this equation. This says mu equals the summing of our scores divided by the number of scores. So this letter mu, this is a Greek letter. And so it looks kind of like a fancy uh, cursive M. And the fact that it's Greek, it works perfectly here. Because you might have heard the phrase, like, it's Greek to me. We usually say that when we don't know things. Like, oh, I don't know, it's Greek to me. That works perfectly, because I'm never going to really know the population mean. And so I can use Greek symbols to indicate the population mean. Um, and then I'll use Roman letters for the sample. And Roman letters are letters that you're used to reading. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? Those are Roman letters. So when you see Greek letters, that's an alert to you that we're dealing with population data, um, and that's more theoretical in nature. But if, in theory, we could measure everyone, this is how we do it, and we would call it mu. And so we would take the sum of all of our scores. So this fancy little uh, E-looking thing, that's a sigma. That means sum up everything that comes after it. And so in this case, we're going to call those X scores. Everybody that we look at has an X score. There's an X score for Bob, an X score for Mary, an X score for Sue. They all are going to give us their x-score, which in this case would be height. So we're going to sum up all of their heights and then divide by the number of people I looked at. And so we're going to use a big number or letter n here to kind of alert ourselves that we've looked at everyone in the population. So it's a big n. Now, if we were going to look at the sample, it looks like this. It looks very similar, but notice that we set the sample mean to be in x bar. So the magic here isn't really the x in this um, symbol, but it's really the bar. The bar is what makes this kind of telling us it's the sample mean. Because you'll notice it has the same kind of math. It's saying sum up all of our x scores 
that looks the same. And then we sum by, sorry, divide by n, but this time we use a little n to remind ourselves it's a little baby sample. But the, the main difference between the sample mean and the population mean is that we use x bar. So let's say I record height and then I also record how many dogs you own. So I may set height to your x score is height and your y score is how many dogs you own. So if I want to know the mean dog ownership, then I would sum up all the y scores and divide by n, and then I would have this be y bar. And that would tell me that I'm looking at the sample mean for whatever data I collected over here. So right now the math doesn't differ, but we're going to start building on these ideas and we have to differentiate between stuff we won't know and we have to figure out how we would calculate it in theory and then the things that we do know and we're actually going to practically do. So we're going to differentiate between the population mean, which we call mu, and the sample mean, which we call x bar. So let's talk about the pros and the cons of the mean, just like we did for the other two. Pros. It is now the mathematical center of the distribution, not the physical center, which was the median, but now the mathematical center of the distribution. It works for quantitative data. Remember, interval and ratio data are quantitative. They are numbers, so we can calculate a mean for numbers really well. It does not ignore any information. Let's say that last score in that list of scores wasn't a three, but it was a 3,000. Somebody has $3,000 in their pocket. If someone had $3,000 in their pocket, it wouldn't affect the median, but boy, would it affect the mean. The math on that would be um, greatly impacted. So we're no longer ignoring any of that information. M moving forward, we're gonna use the mean for almost all of our statistics. So inferential statistics, is going to be based on the mean. So this is a real big reason why we end kind of singing the praises of the mean. The downsides of the mean. It is influenced by extreme scores. So if somebody did have $3,000 in their pocket, that mean is going to be way higher than if it had been just three. So um, the fact that this bullet point, influenced by extreme scores, is on this side and not ignoring any information is on this side, they will always flank each other. So you'll notice for the median, those two items were switched. Um, here we would say does, it wasn't influenced by extreme um, scores, but in the median, we ignored a lot of information. So if you're not ignoring information, then that means if you have an extreme score, it's going to be influencing you or the calculation. And so that's something to, to consider. That's a downside. We don't like our data to be driven just by one person, um, but we also don't like ignoring data either. And then the last downside, like we saw with the median, is we may end up with data that don't really exist, um, like we saw here. We had $1.57 was the average amount in someone's pocket. Actually, nobody had exactly $1.57 in their pocket, but that's the kind of data that our numbers generated. And so as statisticians, we're okay with that, um, but we just need to be aware of the fact that it could be misleading to other people if we say the average was $1.57. They might think that somebody actually had that amount in their pocket.